We want to check into the future. Diverse on-screen representation is very important and it has been shown to have a powerful social impact, especially on the youth. This is why we wanted to see the big picture with the future. And we will have a researcher, author and speaker who is absolutely awesome to tell us how does representation affect youth and in our society? What is essential to inspire next generation and I will call, or actually it's a pre-recorded session, this is why we would not have Q&As for that one, but I will call Dr. Yalda T. Uls, the founder of the Center for Scholars and Storyteller. She is an internationally recognized, award-winning research scientist and educator. You might know the uh, research project, the AIR research project, Authentically Inclusion Representation. You should check it out. She is, at any case, um, inquiring to how media affect young people. And she knows what she's talking about because she was uh, a senior movie executive at MGM before and Sony. So please let us hear and watch Yalda T. Uls, Dr. Yalda T. Uls. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this talk. The floor is yours. Hi. Thanks for having me. I am thrilled to be um, giving a talk here um, at the CPH Docs Festival. I only wish I could be live. Um, I'm, I'm um, talking to you from Los Angeles, California, where I live. Um, my name is Yelda T. Uhls, and I started UCLA's Center for Scholars and Storytellers, which um, is where we focus on unlocking the power of storytelling to help the next generation thrive and grow. So I'm gonna start my talk now and um, I will tell you a little bit about the center and some other things as well. So the center was founded on the concept of collaboration. My background is I used to be a movie executive. I worked at MGM, I worked at Sony, I supervised many, many movies when I was a movie executive. My last job was senior vice president at MGM in production and development. I worked with writers, directors, storytellers, helping craft movies for the studios I worked for. I then decided to get a PhD in child development when I became a mom. And I've spent the last about 12 years doing research in the academic field, studying how media impacts kids. And these two expertise and experience made me realize, you know, that the two careers I had, the values are actually similar. Storytellers want to impact the world. All of you probably want to positively impact the world. Um, but, you know, when you're a storyteller making a piece of content for a financier, your job is to get as many people to see it as possible. And, you know, so it's a business model. Um, but, you know, there are many, many storytellers and, and people in power who want to do good for the world. And then researchers, um, that's, that's their DNA, they're academic, they're trying to figure out how to positively impact the world. So there's shared values. And so what we decided to do was launch the Center for Scholars and Storytellers to bring together all these groups, including youth, and our focus is really teens, 10 to 25, um, to talk about ways we could use the power of entertainment media to help young people thrive and grow. So how do you have a positive impact on youth? Reach them where they're at, on screens. Um, social scientists know that the most effective interventions um, meet people where they're already at rather than bringing them into a lab and making them, you know, or making them do something that they would naturally do if you can bring the intervention, which is sort of the what you're trying to do to improve someone's life um, to them. That, that's the most effective way to do it. So we focus on narrative systems at the center because that's where teens are. And we look at linear story, storytelling, but we also look at second screen experiences because youth today watch content, but they are often using their other screen, a 
phone or something um, to also interact with friends or look things up. Our sweet spot, as I said, is adolescence. That's a critical age for cognitive flexibility, for developing identity, for figuring out who you are. And by focusing at this intersection, you know, scholars, storytellers, and youth, we're in a place, there's a gap. Nobody else, as far as we know, does that. Um, and we're trying to, you know, make impact with that in that gap. One important premise for our work is we don't assume academics know everything, um, that the expertise is only going to go from the academic to the storyteller. We believe the storyteller and even youth themselves can offer um, a lot of expertise. It's a collaborative effort. So we bring all these people together and we talk about ways we can work together. Um, and we focus on issues like diversity and inclusion, mental health, and uh, inequality. And what these do, these, these collaborations, we then end up managing the work that comes out of them. And they lead to research tools, they lead to research reports. I'm going to share with you some of our work. Um, and those research tools are used by the storytellers in their everyday practice. But because they were involved and gave us their perspective, um, they are much more effective. So why storytelling? Storytelling has been um, shown to shift culture. Um, in, and this is a very um, powerful example of that. So in 2008 to 2016, um, Barack Obama was president in the United States. At the same time, Glee was on the air. You may know that show. And um, in 2016, researchers at Harvard wanted to see if there was a shift in unconscious race bias. We had a black president after all, you know, perhaps that changed the way people thought about race. And they found no shift, unfortunately, in race bias. At the same time, however, they found a dramatic shift um, in LGBTQ unconscious bias. And um, it, it, hit, it dropped 13%, which is very dramatic for unconscious bias. And they credit stories and stories like Glee, um, where they showed a social norm of, um, you know, people with different sexual orientations, all sorts of things um, being part of um, the everyday life of adolescents. This other study is another study that shows you the power of representation. When scientists try to look at how young children think about gender, they ask them to draw a scientist. And um, a few decades ago, and I, and I think this is U.S. only, um, only 1% drew a female scientist, um, but now 28% do. And then the researchers credit representation, um, you know, either having a direct role model or seeing it on screen or in the books you read. Um, that's how kids start thinking about different occupations. And so since presumably not too many kids have role models in their direct lives that are um, scientists, um, representation was a probable cause for the shift. So why care about diversity, equity, inclusion? And that's what we're talking about. In the United States, as you may know, and yesterday, in fact, was a historic day with um, the trial of the verdict against Derek Chauvin. Um, people are really thinking about this um, deeply. And, and in the industry, they're thinking about it deeply. So the moral case is to show representation matters. Children's media really shapes their attitudes. There are other things as well, but children's media is an important piece. And this piece of research really is poignant about why and how um, what children look at shapes how they think about themselves. The study looked over a year at how much television Black girls and boys and white girls and boys consumed. It also measured their self-esteem. And at the end of the year, they found that out of those kids who watched the most television, only one group had increased self-esteem, and that was white boys. Everybody else had decreased self-esteem. Self and the presumption was that all of the television that they were consuming was um, impacting how they felt about themselves. And the group that you know, had the most status on television, was the most representative um, white males, um, their self-esteem increased and everyone else decreased. And there have been similar findings um, for Latino Hispanic youth as well. 
Um, and on top of it, in the US, um, uh, people, ch children and households which have lower incomes, which correlates with um, race um, in the US, they spend a lot more time on media and watching content and playing games. So they're playing all these games, they're watching all this content, it's making them feel worse about themselves. Um, you know, and that's that's a really strong moral case for thinking about this. And this generation really cares about advocacy. Um, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, they're much more aware and activists. They and act, active. They're active against systemic racism, and they have been. Um, their attitudes have been measured, and they are more liberal about a whole bunch of things. So it's actually um, not only a moral case. There's a business case to do this because um, the audience demands it. The young audience. So now I'll tell you a little bit about our work in this area. This is called the AIR Report. Uh, we released this last October. It got a lot of press. It came out of one of our think tanks, which brought together scholars and storytellers. And out of that think tank, um, we talked about different ways we could get the industry to start thinking more seriously about changing representation, on-screen representation. And the storytellers told our scholars, you can't just make the moral case. You have to make a business case. Show them that they're going to lose money if they don't do this. So we set out, Gerald Higginbottom, our um, grad student in our, um, who's one of our fellows, um, they set out to figure out if we could make a business case. So first we had to figure out what is air, authentically inclusive representation. And so what we thought about was, you know, We've spent a lot of time and attention thinking about what's on screen, how many people, how many characters are diverse, who's behind the camera, but it doesn't always translate to really authentically inclusive representation. We need to look even deeper and look at the way people are portrayed on screens. So we, we certainly counted within our um, definition how people are represent, how many people are, but we also tried to look at diversity and storytelling. Um, and we were able to find a um, source of reviews called Mediaversity, um, where they shared their data um, and they actually looked quite deeply at diversity and inclusion on gender, race, and sexual orientation. And this is an example of um, how they rate the bottom were their scores. So if a um, movie got an F or a television show, the question is, how is this green? greenlit and an A plus um, was obviously a big, big, um, a great representation. Very few pieces of content got A plus. Um, so we looked at 109 films and we broke it down by budget size because larger budget movies usually make more money at the box office because they put a lot more money behind it and they're shown on more screens, at least pre-COVID. Um, and we looked at the first weekend domestic box office and this is all free on our site. You can download it if you're interested. Um, and we we created a metric where we which we called the norm, just average you know performance on diverse AIR for um, movies. And we looked at above the norm and below the norm. And what we actually found was that movies that um, big budget movies that uh, are rated below the norm lose thirty two point two million dollars at the box office. And if you think about that over the course of a movie's release, that's almost 130 million. And even um, average budget movies, same thing, they lose money as well. Um, and when we released this, the industry really paid attention and people keep talking about this because we're making a business case for this. Um, just to give you an example of what uh, these movies look like, um, these are two ratings, one that of a Star Wars movie, one that rated above the norm and one that rated below the norm. This is in the report, um, and one of them, you know, it, it, it costs more weekend one bo box office. It did significantly less than Rogue One, a Star Wars story. So, you know, even when many of the elements of the storytelling are the same, if one doesn't do as good of a job at this AIR, this authentically inclusive representation, we found it lost money. And here's an average budget film. And this is interesting because Shaft um, features many, many, many black actors. The um, writer and director was black. Girls Trip, same thing. 
but one of them was successful and one of them wasn't. And um, this rating, um, the AIR rating, um, shows that the diversity on the um, actual movies on Shaft was um, stereotypical and filled with tropes. So um, this may have correlated with the box office. In addition to releasing our research report, we made sure, and this is all free on our site, we made sure to create um, a tip sheet. We do this all the time and checklists. We've done it for gender roles for men as well. Um, and they've been downloaded on our site by many, many people in the industry. This quote from Melissa Cobb, who's a VP of animation. She downloaded our boys tip sheet to share with her team. So they're being used by the industry to help them um, do what they do. And as I said, you know, what we do is we try to collaborate together, create content, and then hope that what we create is used in the daily practice of industry. And it seems to be working. We also released um, the REM test, the REM test, Race in Entertainment Media. Some of you may think of the band. I certainly did, um, but other people may be thinking about sleeping, but race it's, it stands for Race in Entertainment Media. So we this is just really something to help people sort of think through. It's not scientific, but to sort of think through, is this movie um, really advancing diversity and inclusion? Is it authentic? Um, and if, you, if you've heard of the Bechtel test, it was sort of modeled on that, but we went a little bit further. Um, so, and this has been downloaded nearly a thousand times. It's, it's, anyone can take it. Does the movie feature two named characters who are non-white, very similar to the Bechtel test? Do they speak to each other? Do they talk about something that wasn't centered on a white character? But then we thought we needed to go a little bit further what are they talking about? And is the conversation reinforcing a positive or negative stereotype? A positive stereotype is just as bad. Asians are good at math. You know, there's, there's, you know, so that's positive. You're good at math, but it's a stereotype. So um, we ask people to probe these questions. And um, you can take it. Um, you know, we have this URL, if you're interested, um, we'd be interested in your opinions. We're, we're collecting data as for everyone who takes it to see um, what people think about the content that's out there. So back to Gen Z, Gen Alpha, back to youth, why we need to do this. We have to meet them where they are. Um, and this clip should tell you about, um, this is a student and an intern who works with us actually, she's amazing. And um, when I asked, she was in my class and I asked the students to think about um, diversity and inclusion and what they think about it. She, she said something really smart, um, which also might, might be why the industry is now changing the way they think because they're losing this audience. Hi. I talked for a moment in my group about how social media and YouTube is like a platform where people who may have not made it in like Hollywood now have a chance to speak their voice. And um, I know like my siblings and I grew up watching like Niga Higa and other like Asian American YouTubers that we just loved and adored. Um, because we, I mean, that representation just wasn't on Disney Channel as much. Um, and also, I know we mentioned earlier in the lecture about, like, um, characters or leads with disabilities. And I know I watch a lot of YouTube channels um, where, you know, there's one um, young lady who's blind and she makes videos about what it's like being blind or being deaf. And so, like, there's these small communities and niches of, um, you know, where people are able to speak their voice and they actually reach a pretty large audience. So I think that's a really cool thing about YouTube, um, that it is it provides that space for people to speak their voice. So as you see, um, the student and this generation are seeking out social media. YouTube is the most popular platform. Um, they're on social media and possibly it's because there's more diversity of voices. So um, they're going to continue to leave um, legacy media if there is no diversity. On top of it, this this um, is a very popular TikToker. Um, she's got 60 million, probably more followers since I created. I think she's at 100 million now. 
Um, and and yet when she put this um, video on Black Lives Matters, um, she got most of her views. She got so many views. So she was expressing um, what this generation thinks that, that they want to um, that they really, really care about um, systemic racism. Um, and these are some of the um, other things this generation says. They they want influencers to be authentic, to care, and they want to make a difference in the world. Um, and they know their power. They know that they have power, these young people, and they know that and they believe they can make changes and they are making changes. So 57% um, of, of them believe power should belong to everyone. Um, only 38% of young people feel like they're represented in the media. 70% say they respect brands that are participating in social um, issues and they make choices about what to spend their money based on um, based on these social issues. Um, and almost, you know, many, many of them believe increased diversity is good for society, um, which is um, at a much higher percentage than other generations. So bottom line is diversity is good for everyone, particularly the youth in America um, under 18, uh, it's majority uh, marginalized groups or people of color, it's actually minority white now. Um, so to make impact with content, there's a business case, there's a moral case, representation needs to have, diverse representation needs to happen, authentically inclusive representation needs to happen. And I hope that all of you will go forth and think about that and um, change the world. Oops, thank you so much for having me and feel free to reach out. I've got my um, our info email, um, info at scholarsandstorytellers.com. You can, you know, go to our site and download anything you want for free. Um, thanks so much for having me.